invite our first uh, lecturer, uh, my dear colleague at uh, Stony Brook, uh, Dominic, uh, Professor uh, Dominic Schneble. Uh, Dominic received his uh, PhD from University of uh, Constance in Germany in 2002. He then uh, moved as a postdoctoral researcher to MIT and the Harvard uh, Center for Ultra Cold Atoms, where he started to collaborate with uh, Wolfgang Ketterle, who received uh, just a year before that uh, a Nobel Prize uh, for his work on uh, cold uh, atoms. Uh, after uh, doing uh, spectacular work at uh, MIT, uh, Dominic came to Stony Brook in 2005 where he built uh, his own uh, group uh, focusing on the physics of ultra-cold uh, atoms. And uh, he has uh, become uh, one of the world uh, leaders in the field of uh, analog uh, quantum simulations with cold atoms. And his lecture today will be on uh, quantum simulations of uh, light matter uh, interactions. Uh, welcome, Dominic. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... Dima for the in kind introduction and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to give a lecture in this uh, series and especially to be the first one that's a great honor and obligation certainly. <laughs> so I want to uh, tell you uh, about some work that we have done with ultra cold atoms on quantum simulations of, of light matter interactions. And uh, just to give you a little introduction to this field. So uh, this is from the European Quantum Technologies flagship uh, report from 2017, where you see the field of quantum information science uh, broken up into pillars. These pillars are quantum, quantum communication, computation, simulation, and sensing. And all these pillars, of course, are based on basic science. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about basic science today. I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that, but uh, please interrupt me if you uh, feel that it's, 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 it's too technical at some points. I'll try to avoid it as much as I can. So I'm going to tell you about one of those pillars, which is a quantum simulation pillar. And this is a very famous a paper and a, a quotation from Richard Feynman from 1981, where he considered the problem of simulating physicalist computers. And there's this very famous statement. I will not quote all the words in this statement where it says, nature isn't classical. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical, meaning that you cannot use a classical, classical computer and hope to be able to describe the physics of a complicated quantum system simply because the capacity uh, that the quantum system has is so much bigger than a, 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 a classical system. And therefore, you cannot hope to be able to simulate a quantum uh, system or a natural system with nothing but uh, uh, with a classical computer. You have to make it quantum. OK, and so this is the idea then of quantum simulation. So you have a system which is initialized in some state. It follows a Schrodinger equation as a Hamiltonian. And according to this Hamiltonian, it will evolve in time. And at some point, when you are interested to look at it, you will look at the system and read out its state. So we can uh, write this as a time of evolution operator here. And if you have a quantum computer, then you can, if the Hamiltonian is more or less well behaved, you can break down this time evolution into a sequence of local gates that's called trotterization at very small times. And so in principle, if you have a quantum computer, you can, you can uh, follow the time evolution and calculate it as, uh, as you want to arbitrary precision. This is known as digital quantum simulation. Uh, the problems here is, are that you need a very large number of gates if you have a long time evolution. And in every single time step, uh, delta t, you incur a small error. And so you need mechanisms to uh, correct for this error. And those mechanisms are, are, are costly and they are um, basically too costly for a size, sizable quantum system, at least with the present technology. So this is different approach. 
which is, is uh, the following. Let's say we have another system, which we call simulator, which is initialized uh, here at time equal to zero. It's described by a different wave function. It follows the different Hamiltonian. It will, um, hold on, let me get the laser pointer here. Um, it will, it will give you a, fi a different a final state, maybe on a different time scale. But if you have a correspondence or mapping between these Hamiltonians, and if you have a correspondence between the initial states here of the system, then you know that if you follow this evolution of the simulator, you can learn something about the uh, state of the system that you're trying to, trying to study. Uh, this is um, known as analog quantum uh, simulation. I'm writing this here with GUE in the sense that we're building an analog system uh, to our system that we want to study. Um, we prepare it, we follow its natural evolution, and then we measure its final state. The nice thing is about a system like this that it is usually simpler so we are concentrating on the uh, main features of the Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian or the system is tunable. Uh, so you have sort of knobs that you, can, that you can dial and adjust your Hamiltonian with. And in that sense, it's also good to call this analog quantum simulation simply because you have knobs, uh, parameters which you can control. So, um, Oops, I need to get rid of this zoom window here. So, so um, the, the advantage of this is that the system, your simulator contains all the quantum information. And if you study a real system, there will always be some decoherence in the system itself. So that's certainly acceptable for the real world. And so as long as the decoherence of the simulator is less than the decoherence of the system, you are certainly able to simulate the system, even though you have a decoherence uh, in, in your simulator. And so that's certainly tolerable. The only problem is that you need to validate that your simulator actually describes the system that you try to study. So that is something as an experimentalist that one always has to make sure that parameters aren't drifting away, for example, or that uh, something, uh, uh, something maybe un uh, some uncontrolled uh, uh, um, effect doesn't doesn't occur. So this is an is a central piece uh, as an experimentalist to keep this system uh, uh, viable. So here uh, this idea of uh, analog simulation is actually very old. So you see here an analog simulator from 1949, where at the time they tried to um, simulate. Uh, the, the physics of an airplane. So uh, nowadays, this looks quite similar. This is a picture here of, of my lab with one of the students. Um, and uh, so, of course, the things that we want to study or that we study are quite different. But the basic idea is the same, that you, that you program some sequence into your simulator. You run the sequence, and then you, 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 you uh, basically you, you let your Hamiltonian do its job and then you, you read out uh, the result in the end. So what we do in our lab with our simulators is that we study quantum gases and optical lattices. So we make connections to solid state physics, to nonlinear optics, to open quantum systems. Basically a whole bunch of things throughout physics that, that are accessible. I mean, that's one thing that one has to uh, keep in mind that. Uh, and that an analog simulator often is not universal, but it's sort of uh, um, geared at a certain set of problems. And so if you have an optical lattice here, which I just show us with this uh, sine wave, it's clear that solid state physics, for example, is one of the, uh, uh, um, one of the uh, targets of, of study. Okay, so our system looks like, or our simulator, if you want, looks like, Many simulators look that are in labs throughout the world. So you have lots of uh, lasers, you have lots of mirrors, you have vacuum, you have movable parts. And with this, we, we, uh, we program our Hamiltonian or we, we write our, we, we build our Hamiltonian. There's no Intel inside, but atomic physics inside this whole thing. 
And so you have to know atomic physics very well in order to make this simulator uh, do uh, what it's supposed to do. Okay, so I should say ultra cold atoms are not the only platform that are use, is used for quantum simulations. There's a whole bunch of other platforms out there. For example, you can use Rydberg atoms in optical tweezers. They give you nice long range interactions. You can use trapped ions. Uh, they also interact quite nicely and over long range. Uh, you can use circuit QED. We'll, we, are, we will hear about this later on in this uh, conference. Uh, where you use um, microwave uh, radiation to couple transmont qubits uh, to one another. And, or you can have photonic systems. This is basically a bunch, what you see here, a bunch of uh, fibers that are very close to each other, which allow tunneling across them. And so you see here a propagation of a, a ballistic propagation of a, of a photon across the uh, fiber bundle. So, but uh, I want to go back to our ultra cold atoms. And I recognize that we are probably a pretty broad audience. Uh, and so I want to give you a little bit of a flavor about what's involved in this, uh, this machine. So what are what the techniques are that we are using in order to build these Hamiltonians. Okay, so the first thing is something that you might be familiar with or have heard about certainly it's, it's a uh, it's a, uh, let me get rid of my laser pointer again. I need to access the, um, need to access the mouse somehow. Help. <laughs> um, yeah, somehow. Could somebody help me? Um, I have I have a problem um, accessing. So what do you what do you want to do, Dominic? I basically I want to click on the on this movie and make the ah. move. Oh, and I have this Con control L to turn off your laser. Control, control L. L. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, so we start out we start out with something that you are, might be quite familiar with, which is laser cooling. So we take laser beams. Uh, put them together and we cross them between magnetic fields and generate a cloud of atoms from, from an atomic vapor, which is uh, uh, about a billion atoms and a millikelvin cold. So it's a, it's a it's very cold temperature, but it's not quantum yet. Then we take this cloud, we put it in a magnetic trap. Sorry for the noise if you have this noise here. We put it in a magnetic trap, we transport the atomic cloud into a glass cell where we have very, very good uh, uh, background pressure. And there we do something called uh, evapor evaporative cooling. And so uh, when you cool down a gas, the, the Broy waves uh, start to overlap. And if you have bosonic atoms, you form a so-called Bose-Einstein condensate where the particles uh, have lost their distinguishability and can be written as a macroscopic wave function here. Yeah, uh, So it's the analog basically of a laser or light. This is a, a, a macroscopic field, a macroscopic matter wave field. And typically you need to go, go down to 100 nanokelvins uh, uh, to get to, to this state. And it's basically a starting point for our quantum simulations. Yeah, I should say the Nobel Prize, I think this was mentioned in the introduction, was, uh, was, was given in 2001 for, for, for the BC and four years before that for laser cooling. So these are really central techniques nowadays that allow for this quantum sim uh, simulation experiment. Here you see uh, the emergence of a Bose-Einstein condensate as the temperature is lower. This is from our lab. So you see, we go down to 30 nanokelvins and you see this black blob here. This is a highly a quantum degenerate blob of atoms. It's a macroscopically populated matter wave. The size of, the, of this uh, blob in real space, this is a momentum space, but in real space is about 
the thickness of a human hair, or a, a little bit less, depends on how thick you think uh, a hair, human hair should be. <laughs> so this is about 20 micrometers across. Um, now, when you think about atomic physics that we have inside our simulator, you think typically of a hydrogen atom, you know, about the, uh, of the Bohr atom, and, and the energy scales, or uh, 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 they are quite high, is 10, 10 electron volts. The uh, speeds are very high too. I mean, on the lowest Bohr orbit, you have about a percent of the speed of light. And the, the sizes that you're dealing with in atomic physics, in classical atomic physics, uh, are very small so on, on the order of angstroms. But in this Bose Einstein condensate, as I said already, it's, it's the, the quantum mass is on a macroscopic scale, and it's about 10 micrometers, which means also that all the dynamics is much, much slower. So we're talking about millimeters per second in terms of typical speeds or milliseconds of time scales. So these are the natural kind of time scales on which the, the quantum simulations uh, are done. So in terms of distance in energy from, from a classical or uh, traditional atomic physics, a Bose-Einstein condensate or an ultra-cold atomic gas is about as far away as, as, as high energy physics is. So um, it's still part of atomic physics, but you see that over the past uh, 100 years, a lot of uh, uh, exploration has happened towards the lower energies. And that is what makes all these experiments possible. Okay, so how do we detect what we have? So basically, you, you just take a laser beam, you shine it at your, uh, at your atomic sample, and then you image the atomic, uh, the, the, the shadow of this, uh, of this atomic sample onto a CCD camera, and you get a black spot. Yeah? And this is very tiny. So there's uh, now, nowadays technologies called quantum gas microscopes, where you can actually look in situ where, where the atoms are. But if you don't uh, need this, you can do something called time of flight imaging. And so this is what you see here. This is an atomic cloud which has been released from an, uh, from an optical lattice. And you see that there's this characteristic pattern that appears as a function of time. Actually, I should tell you that it's falling down. Yeah, so this gravity pulling the cloud down. And as it's falling down, it expands. And so you get basically a view of a momentum space. So atoms which were in there, they started, they were already moving. They have now moved out to this point. And so you can detect beautifully where the atoms are in momentum space. And this is something we, we need very much in our experiments. Okay, now, uh, so far I have just uh, talked about- hey, can, I, can I ask a quick question? Yes, yeah, sure, yes. Uh, that that image is a real image, not a Fourier image. This is this is a real image in uh, taken with the camera, but it's basically a Fourier transform of the in, initial distribution, simply due to the fact that you have time of flight expansion. I see. Thank so you. It, it, it's basically still a little bit the convolution of the initial uh, distribution with the uh, uh, momentum distribution. But if you wait long enough, on the order of ten. Or 20 milliseconds, you are able to nicely sort of distinguish what the momenta are in there. I see. Uh, does this answer the question? Yeah, yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, so far, I have dealt with the atoms as if they had no internal degrees of freedom. So they are basically just balls in which blow out and become uh, the Broglie waves and then form this was Einstein condensate, which uh, is kind of nice to look at. But um, atoms also have an important property that they have internal states. So we use an alkali atom. They have a uh, um, uh, hyperfine uh, ground state manifold here in the, uh, S, uh, uh, S1 half, the F equal one and F equal two. And each one of those Zeeman sublevels can actually encode a spin. So if you select our two states here, I call them red and blue, you can now drive uh, Rabi oscillations between these uh, states if you address them uh, uh, resonantly. And so that's what, what's shown here. So we start out in red. At some point, we end up in blue. 
Then we are back in red, and we're back in blue, back in red. And then in between, we are in a superposition between red and blue. So this is uh, red plus blue, and this is red minus blue here. Um, of course, we have a macroscopic number of atoms. So it is not like you would see a blue blob appear sometimes here and a, blue, a red blob appear here sometimes. But this is a massively uh, kind of uh, parallel operation here in the sense that each atom is in a superposition, but we have about a hundred thousand or a million of or up to a million atoms, and so you will you will see an ensemble average. So this looks really smooth as you go from red to blue to uh, red to blue again. Okay, so how do we detect this actually? So you could use some kind of state dependent imaging, but what we do actually is very much simpler we just use a magnetic field gradient and put the atoms in there now these uh, states here are magnetic field sensitive so if you put something magnetic field sensitive in a magnetic field gradient you will get the stern gerlach effect and so what you see is that when you apply this uh, field that your cloud rips into pieces and then you know that on one side you have the red ones and on the on the other side you have the blue ones and so we take just a region of interest here and here, and then you see that these uh, you see those blobs after the interaction with the microwave. Okay, so finally, a final ingredient that we have is a, a so-called state-dependent optical potentials. So this is nothing but uh, basically an optical tweezer that we generate, but we generate it in a way. That is first of all not a tweezer, but it's a standing wave, most often so an optical lattice. The, uh, uh, so it's, a, it's just a laser beam which is reflected into itself and it gives you this interference pattern. And if you shine this light in between the D1 and D2 uh, 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 transitions of an alkali atom, there is a point where the effects just cancel out. And so nothing happens here if, if you're in blue, but if you're in red, you get the effect. And so you can use this to realize, for example, a sinusoidal potential here for the red and no potential for the blue. And this will be very important for, for our experiments. And we can detect this. Here you see one of those diffraction patterns as if we're falling down in the time of flight image. You see here that the red has diffraction peaks in this direction. Here's one, here's one. The blue doesn't have anything. And so this means there's no lattice for the blue. Now you ask why are there the blobs on the uh, left and right side? This is simply because this was a three-dimensional lattice, but we only had the state dependence along one direction here, along this direction. Okay, so now, now I'm ready to sort of address this question, how can one simulate the interaction between matter and light? And first of all, why, why would one want to do this? <laughs> so, uh, let me just give you a, 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 a one slide summary of this. So what we do is that we build out of these ingredients a system whose Hamiltonian just looks like the Hamiltonian of a two-level atom that's uh, radiating. This is a famous uh, Hamiltonian, first developed by Dirac and then uh, solved by Weisskopf and, and, and Wigner. And so we realize it in the context not of photons that leave an atom as it decays to the ground state, but it's actually a well that empties itself and sends out an atom instead of a photon. But the, the physics is, or the Hamiltonian is the same. And therefore, if one believes in quantum simulation, we should be able to study effects that have to do with the interaction of light and matter in this context. Which is completely different. It has a different time scale. Remember the milliseconds, uh, millimeters per second speeds, not 10 to the 8 meters per second, but uh, as for a photon, but it's uh, the same physics. And so we should be able to use this system as a simulator for radiating uh, atoms. And so the interest of this is actually uh, that in uh, quantum information uh, science, one wants to have qubits talk to each other. And those qubits, they can, for example, be uh, 
transmon qubits and they talk to each other through photons or through, through electromagnetic radiation. And so one of the big uh, um, pushes here is to make qubits interact through a photonic channel such that they are strongly coupled to the channel and do not spontaneously decay to the outside world, but that the photons basically go in the channel, move in the channel and come back out. And so this way you can entangle, you, you can entangle these, uh, these, these, these qubits. So there's different efforts here. Um, here's again a uh, uh, microwave uh, waveguide that, that uh, will then be coupled or is coupled to, to these uh, uh, transmont qubits. Or oh, here is a different uh, setup. It's a so-called optical crystal, a photonic crystal, where you have a periodic, periodically modulated uh, uh, refractive index so that the photons propagating in the waveguide actually have a band structure. You know, so they, they will uh, sort of propagate this as, a, as an electron would in the crystal. And the, and the idea is that if you have a band structure, you can if you go to the band edge, you can make the photons very slow. And when they are very slow, they will interact with these atoms very long, and this creates a very potentially a very strong coupling. So these are these are efforts in this field that uh, are on the underway, and they all involve, of course, photons. Challenges here are as, as I said, how to achieve the strong coupling and how to beat down on the losses that you have to the surrounding vacuum. This is known as a Purcell factor. And this is uh, typically on the order of 10 to 100 ma maximally. So uh, it is um, often not easy to, uh, uh, to push these systems into the strongly coupled regime. But of course, it's a moving target and those, those groups move fast. And I should say in circuitry, they have moved very fast over the past uh, five years or so. So strong coupling is, uh, is not out of reach anymore. OK, so what those photonic crystals have, they're so-called atom photon bound states. I will tell you about what this is. This is something that had not been uh, observed directly. And we, with our simulator, were the first ones to be able to, to look at this and, and study it in detail. Okay, so now let me tell you how we uh, realize this, this, this quantum emitter of matter waves. So I'm not calling this a foot, an atom anymore. I'm just calling this a quantum emitter. So quantum emitter is basically a two-level atom, has an excited state, has a ground state, and is coupled to uh, the electromagnetic uh, vacuum. Okay, so when you look at an atom and you don't look at it very uh, very uh, much in detail, but just uh, in, a, in a very coarse grained way for the uh, purposes that you are interested in, you can think of an atom or a quantum emitter as a container for a photon. So you can say, well, if the photon is inside, I call this an excited state. And then at some point, the photon comes out again as the uh, 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 emitter goes to the ground state. And what makes it come out is the tickling by the vacuum. Yeah, so there's this famous uh, uh, Weisskopf uh, and, and Wigner model that describes this. So as the atom goes to the ground state, the energy is released, in, as I said, as, in terms of uh, as a photon. And it has a, a, a wavelength and momentum that are just related here in, in this inverse way. And it has a dispersion relation, which is, which is linear for uh, of vacuum propagation or propagation in free vacuum. Okay, so if this is all that a uh, quantum emitter is, then it's fairly easy for us to build a simulator for this. So we just need to build a container. The container contains an excitation. There is some coupling to a vacuum, which we have to define, and the excitation comes out. And then we call what comes out uh, as equivalent to, to the photon. So why is this possible? Because, uh, okay, so here's rest mass, rest energy. This is something that sort of falls out of the equation. We don't have to deal with this. 
Why is, why is an atom equivalent to a photon? It's because of the De Broglie wavelength uh, relationship that we have here. If you have a momentum, uh, you have a De Broglie wavelength. Yeah? And so the De Broglie wavelength here takes the place of the wavelength of the photon. Now, the dispersion relation is different. You have uh, energy is one half mv squared. So your momentum goes like the square root of the energy. But we are lucky in the sense that if you are in a photonic band gap material, in a photonic crystal close to an, an edge, the photons acquire an effective mass. And so you get the same dispersion relation. And so we get the direct correspondence here between this atomic emitter and this quantum emitter coupled to uh, a photonic um, crystal. Okay, so the tools that we need, I already discussed them. Yeah, we need two levels. We need the coupling between them with strength omega and, and the tuning delta to try for Rabi oscillation. We need the state dependent potential, we have that. Uh, and we need detection that is sensitive on to, to the momentum. So this is this uh, uh, time of flight image that, that you saw and the Stern Gerlach separation. So we can we can get out what is red and what is blue and how fast are they moving. Okay, so these are standard ingredients. Yeah, I, sh I should have mentioned that we start out with the mod insulator. So we take out both Einstein condensate, we put in an optical lattice, we make it such that we have one atom per site. And then we sort of eliminate all the atoms except for a few. And these are our, uh, our wells that we are interested in. So um, once again, uh, in a little bit of different version, we have our two states. We apply our coupling depending on the detuning that shifts the states around. So now here you have red on top of blue. It's not really uh, important in the end. I mean, it, it's just important because the higher state should see the lattice. Um, so your Hamiltonian here now is just Rabi oscillations. So we, we kill a red atom, we, 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 we create a blue one or vi vice versa. Yeah. And what we have now is a situation that we have that we have a state dependent lattice. So what does this mean? It means that the red atom is sits in the well. It cannot move. But the blue atom, which doesn't see the lattice, can move around. If it can move around, it will have kinetic energy, and that shifts its total energy around. It's a continuum of states, yeah. Which means that there is now a a uh, resonant uh, process. So without changing energy, you can go from red to blue if you just let the microwave help you with that. Yeah. So there's no energy cost, so it will happen. Whenever we have a coupling, two states which are cu coupled, if it's energetically allowed and if it's allowed by other selection rules, it will happen. So this will happen. The red atom will go here to the blue state. It will be released. It will fall out of the well. It will move because it, these are momentum states. And so the Hamiltonian, which describes this, is exactly maps exactly to the Weisskopf Wigner model in the following sense. I have basically translated this Hamiltonian here into this picture that you define your situation as follows there is a well. If the well is full, you call this an excited state. If the well is empty, you call this a ground state. And so going from full to empty releases a blue atom. And so this is your photon that's that's coming out. Yeah. Or it takes the takes the space, takes the role of the photon. This just looks like an atom. I've just translated this Hamiltonian <laughs> using this prescription. So this look, this is basically our model. Uh, uh, as it as it appears. Now the question is, what makes the photon or the atom come out? Is there a vacuum tickling the atom, saying, "Hey, please uh, release your 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 your, um, your 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 excitation"? So let's look at the weisskopf wigner model. What happens there if you have a real atom and a real photon? Is that you have a so-called dipole moment? which is, you can think of a tendency of uh, emitting, which is coupling to this, the vacuum 
uh, fluctuation of the electromagnetic field. So you need a vacuum fluctuation and or zero point field. It's not really fluctuation. You need this, you need this, this ingredient and you need dipole moment and that will make the photon come out. We don't have any of that, but instead we have our microwave coupling. <laughs> Microwave coupling and here the overlap between these wave functions. So you can select now which one of those you think of a vacuum fluctuation, which one of those you think of a dipole moment, it comes out to the same. They act together, they, they create the coupling, they make the red atom turn blue and come out of this uh, out of this well. This is the nice thing is it is tunable. Yeah, so we can we can control the strength of the vacuum. This is not easy or even impossible for, uh, for a, a real atom. And we can also tune the excitation energy. So this is this, uh, you see here, this is a, uh, when there's an energy splitting here. And what is this energy splitting? It's basically this detuning of the board gave up Is this a question? Uh, well, I didn't understand it, so let me maybe just continue um, because I don't know who asked. And uh, but let me just continue, maybe. So, so this is tunable. This is where the quantum power of the quantum simulation is. We not only can map our Hamiltonian to the target Hamiltonian that we want to study or the target system, but we can now ask what happens under exotic conditions. So the first thing you do is you reproduce what you know, and then you look at where you could go with this. And then you have something that is might be interesting. And based on that, you can then try to push the development of your real system in, in this, into the same direction. So what we do here is basically create a system that mimics another system and then take it and go explore the parameter space and see if we can discover something new and interesting. So, um, well, a, a conventional atom just decays exponentially. Yeah? It's like radioactive decay. Why is this? Well, because it's very weak. The coupling to the vacuum is relatively very weak compared to this uh, frequency uh, difference between ground and excited state. But you could think of making this coupling very strong. There is no uh, strong coupling. What happens to this exponential decay? Or you could say, let me introduce some kind of gap here. I'm thinking about a photonic crystal already. Let me introduce some kind of gap and see what happens in the decay. Or let me make this state, uh, this continuum, just to be a single state and see what I can get. Now, it turns out this is already well known. So here, <laughs> this just gives you cavity QED. Yeah? So if you put an excited atom in a, in, a, in a resonant cavity, it goes to the ground state. and the photon comes out, is reflected, goes back in, and you get these Rabi oscillations between the cavity and the, and the atom. Now, this here, this is our photonic band gap uh, situation. And this is just strong coupling uh, regime in, 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 in so-called waveguide QED. So we can access all these, all these regimes. So let me speed up a little bit, because I see that I'm uh, lagging a little bit behind. So we can we can have weak coupling with the exponential decay. Okay, so we have made a connection to, to trust that our simulator does what it should. But now we can go to a very strongly coupled regime. This is not something that can be observed in an optical system. And what we see is that there are suddenly oscillations. So it's as if the radiation comes out and goes back in and comes out and goes back in. So this is so-called non-Markovian uh, uh, dynamics. And so it's basically information uh, leaving the system and coming back into the system. And so uh, this is certainly something that is quite interesting in terms of uh, its coherence properties. We can model this. It's simple enough that we can actually make predictions, theoretical predictions. They fit quite nicely here. You see that if you are very far out detuned, you get nice exponential k. If you are close, you get these oscillations. Now, if you look very closely, you see it's not quite uh, uh, completely correct. We don't decay to zero, so the photon doesn't come out completely. Um, but if we include the fact that we have an array of emitters, because this is an optical lattice, and maybe only one of them is excited, 
you get processes where the neighbor can reabsorb. And so if you include this kind of processes, uh, namely, let's call it atom reabsorption. It's not like photon reabsorption, it's atom reabsorption. You can sort of capture these effects nicely. We did this in this original paper um, with a simulation, numerical simulation that, that had only three emitters. Recently, uh, uh, we were able to come up with an analytical theory of, uh, of such array effects. Alfonso Lanusa uh, uh, is, uh, is, is responsible for that. And uh, uh, that can sort of give you uh, with arbitrary precision, if you're able to uh, spend arbitrary amount of time, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the dynamics that you are observing. Okay, so now the emission spectrum. Um, we basically drop everything. Yeah? So if, if an atom is moving, it will fall down, it will expand. So that's what you see here, yeah? these two blobs. So here is the well, it has a red atom in it. Radiation comes out and then falls under gravity and we record it. And so what we can do is we can change the energy of the excited state. And what you see is a nice parabola. <laughs> so more energy means more excitation energy means you're moving faster. Yeah. So one, one, one time you go to the left, one time you go to the right, you average this over many, many iterations and you see this nice symmetric distribution of a parabola. So, um, now there's something exotic here, which is you can also go to negative energy. Yeah? Nobody prevents you from pulling the excited state below the ground state. This is very uh, non-intuitive, but you can do it. And um, so the question is, what happens there? We see there's emission at negative energy. And so let me just pull the excited state below the ground state. Okay, so this is very e easy. <laughs> here we are. The excited state is below the ground state. So now if we are if we are emitting yeah, from the excited to the ground state, we have to absorb energy. Yeah. Or in other words, we are emitting negative energy. Now that's very counterintuitive, but it actually just corresponds to what you have when you emit in a photonic band gap material below the, um, the edge of the, uh, of the band or in a band gap. And negative energy uh, means because we have E is equal to one half mv squared or p squared over 2m, that the momentum is imaginary. And when you think about imaginary momentum, what you think immediately is an exponential decay. Yeah. E to the i kx turns into E to the negative kx. And so you get an evanescent wave. The radiation cannot leave the emitter, but it will sort of try to come out and hover around it. This is uh, shown here uh, as, as an illustration. So we are basically in the ground state or want to go to the ground state, we can't. And there's, that, there's this field surrounding the, the quantum emitter, which is this bound uh, state, yeah, as, as we call it. So we can calculate it, it's an exponential decay. We can also sort of see how we form it. Let's see at negative detuning. Um, and so what you see is when you um, turn on your decay that you get oscillations. So um, there is actually something that's emitted even though it shouldn't, but this is similar to the following situation. Let's say, let's say you have a ball and you have a, a mattress, you know, let's say some water mattress or water bed, and you take this ball and you gently press it into the mattress, then you will form a dimple. Yeah? And so this dimple now surrounds your ball. But if you do this suddenly, then you will have waves traveling on the mattress. And in the end, you have the dimple still because you have your ball that you, have, that you press into the mattress. And so that's exactly what's happening here. That if you suddenly turn on your, your uh, decay, which is something we can do by turning on the microwave coupling, you shed radiation but then you are left with the dimple and this dimple corresponds to this uh, uh, bound state. So we were able to uh, isolate this bound state. This is something you cannot do in a real system. You need a simulator for that. By doing the following, we said, okay, let's, let's turn on our decay. This is 
just what you would normally have. Go in an excited state, you decay, you want to decay, but you can now also turn on your, your vacuum coupling very, very slowly. And in this case, if you take your ball and you gently press it into the mattress, there's no wiggles that are produced. So you only produce the bound state. And we were able to uh, uh, select this all out and isolate our bound state Compare it with the theory, it fits beautifully. And so we take this as a, as a proof, as a direct proof that this bound state exists and that it's formed. And actually, we were the first ones to observe this bound state directly. So this has ne had never been uh, observed in a real system. We observed it in a simulator. But in the end, what's a real system? We can just change our standpoint and say, ours is the real system. <laughs> and, and the if the uh, optical systems are simulators of our our system it works both ways so anyway we, we were able to detect this bound state and and characterize it this had been predicted uh for many years yeah 40 years of 40 50 years and you see that this that, that this bound state is basically interpreted as a photon cloud which surrounds the atom but cannot leave it Okay, um, I'm running out of time. So I will just run through this. We can also have a band structure to have mimic a real photonic crystal. Then our parabola turns into something much more exotic. <laughs> you see that this nice parabolic shape turns into a blob or into a modulated blob. It depends on where you are in the band and how your emitter is oriented with, with uh, respect to this effective photonic crystal that you're uh, producing. This is something also that hadn't, has not yet been done in real photonic systems. So we see here that we can sort of uh, enter territory that's, uh, that's uh, unexplored. Um, what we can in particular do is we can couple to a single band only. So if we go into the stand of a band, we have forbidden areas here, forbidden areas here. There are now two bound states. And what you see is that you can go between perfectly Markovian decay and perfect Rabi oscillation. So we call this here basically free space limit and here the cavity QED limit. And you see that depending on the, how strong you are coupling, you can go here between your exponential decay to a perfectly reversible cavity QED like scenario. And um, we were able here in this paper to um, link the emergence of these oscillations to a beating between bound states in the same way that the Rabi oscillation is a beating of stress states. You have this kind of Rabi-like oscillation. This, much of it comes from a beat between two bound states. And those bound states, um, yeah, you see here the simple theory doesn't reproduce what we have, but we have a better theory now. Again, uh, Alfonso uh, uh, worked on this where we can beautifully reproduce uh, basically what we see. And so we understand what we have. Those bound states, they are located both below the band. This corresponds to the apex of the parabola that we are under and now at the top of the band. And those, those two states, you can detect the lower one just looks a little bit like the one before, but the upper one looks, looks much different. It has peaks momentum. So it's very much uh, modulated in space. And as a result of that, your bound state, if you look very carefully, this was already uh, predicted here by uh, Bukov, the, uh, Vladimir Bukov, who first came up with this idea. You see a modulation up here. Yeah? So this isn't the perfect, isn't the perfect uh, exponential decay, but it's modulated and makes sense because your photonic crystal has a uh, Wigner side cell, and and so it has it's periodic in space. So the uh, the, the, the bound state will have have some kind of memory of that. And so you see this here for more extreme parameters, we have these strong modulations of the bound state. And this might actually be something that one needs to be careful about when one builds in a, a photonic system. You have to be careful where you place your atom, where within this uh, photonic crystal you do that, if you want to have reproducible coupling strength. OK, so just to summarize, Yes, so we do quantum optics with matter waves without photons, basically. There's a lot of overlap uh, between our system and the real system. So we, of course, in terms of technological applications, 
we are not competitive, but we can study effects that are relevant for the photonic systems and are therefore um, uh, sort of make a direct connection to technology. Um, we have done new things here. We have seen non-Markovian decay. We have seen uh, atom photon bound state. We have uh, seen the effects of bands on the bound state structure. We have seen the interplay between the bound states and dynamics. These are things that were not uh, available uh, or have not yet been done in optical systems. Uh, what we are doing now is that we think of these uh, atoms uh, in a well, not as uh, states of a quantum emitter, like empty or, 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 or full, but those atoms, they can themselves tunnel. Yeah. So the atoms in the optical lattice can themselves tunnel. But if you have the vacuum coupling, they are, will be surrounded by this cloud of photons. And so they will form quasi particles, we call this polaritons, which will tunnel through the lattice. They have their own band structure. So they have their own renormalized dispersion relation. This is called here a lower polariton or an upper polariton. This is more atom like. This one, this one here is more photon like, if you want. So we are studying basically the physics of the lower polariton band. And what we have recently done um, is that we started the many body physics that we can get of this. Basically, a, a Bose Hubbard model of polaritons. And so you see here the effect of the polariton formation is twofold. First of all, um, you can have a mod insulator of polaritons as you uh, sort of go to deeper lattice steps. You see that your visibility, which is a measure for the superfluidity, goes down or in the peak width goes up. So you're entering from superfluid to mod state. These are all polaritons. But also, if you, you can have a situation where you already have a mod insulator of atoms, now you turn on the vacuum coupling, you make a polariton, it turns back in, into a superfluid. So these are things that we that we can that we are able to study. And if you now ask what is the real system that corresponds to that, we found that actually exciton polaritons are pretty well uh, matched to this because an exciton polariton is a quasi particle where an exciton in a, a semiconductor binds to a photon which has an effective mass. And as a result of that, the photon gets heavier and the exciton gets lighter. And so we see here that our excitons have a tendency to be more superfluid than the atoms. And so this is the, 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 the direct uh, uh, correspondence here. And now if you think about the upper branch, if you think about the photon, if you have a photon which binds to an exciton and the exitons interact with each other, this means now that the photons can enter, interact with each other. And this is something that one wants to do in quantum information very badly. You want photons, which are the carrier of quantum information, to also interact with each other so that they can use for, be used for quantum processing. And so these, if you think about circuit QED, what you do there is that effectively you're creating in each transmont qubit an effective interaction between photons which move in the, in the, in the waveguide. And so similarly here, if you, have, uh, if you have blue atoms, let's say, that move in your lattice, once they couple to the red ones, they become strongly interacting. And so we have a model here for, uh, for, for this kind of processes as well. But it's a simulator. It's not, it's not really useful in the sense that one can build now uh, a device. OK, with this, I have come to the end of my talk. Let me thank my group, uh, past and present. So here uh, you see uh, people who were involved in the experiments. So that was uh, Ludwig Grinner who got his PhD two years ago, um, or three years ago now, time flies. Um, Arturo Pasminio uh, and Mike Stewart, the most recent uh, graduate. And then Jun Kwan is uh, about to uh, 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 graduate with the work on the polaritons. And we have Alfonso Lanusa, who has done this beautiful theory, and Yangshin Kim, who keeps uh, our machine very, very happy and makes it happier every day. So thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dominic, for this uh, beautiful uh, opening uh, lecture. So as uh, Derek uh, already uh, uh, told you in the chat, uh, you can ask uh, your question uh, by either uh, raising your hand 
uh, using the uh, reactions uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. Or if you prefer, you can type uh, your question uh, in the chat. Okay, so I guess uh, everyone is uh, uh, shy to ask uh, the first uh, question. So uh, maybe uh, let me uh, let me ask uh, a question. So what is the uh, current uh, experimental status on this uh, bound states of uh, photons and uh, exotons? I mean, did people realize uh, this uh, already, or is this so work in progress? So it's, it's a very interesting uh, question. So it, it, in, in circuitry, people usually don't think of polaritons. They think of interacting photons. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there, there's photons which travel down the waveguide. They enter a transmode qubit. It's not linear. The strong nonlinearity makes the photons interact. Yeah? It just creates a photon blockade. So in, in the circuitry platforms, this is uh, of course, very, very well under control. For example, there has been, in terms of quantum simulation, recent work, I mean, it's now two years ago, from uh, um, John Simon's group in, in Chicago, who, who, who realized of a mod insulator of photons. Yeah. So basically, it's a chain of maybe 10 or so uh, 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 transmond qubits, and this system undergoes a superfluid to, to mod transition. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's one thing. Of course, it's an open system, so it's not exactly what we have. So in our system, by design, we don't have any losses. Yeah? So we, the only way that an atom can escape is into the waveguide, whereas in a real system, it can escape into the lab. And, and so the, 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 uh, the, not all aspects are equal. In our, in our, in our system, the the, the effects are much more strong, let's say it this way. Yeah. Okay, now, so as, if, as far uh, as exoton uh, polaritons are concerned, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there is work on the way to get strongly interacting exotons. For example, in uh, nanophotonically uh, modulated semiconductors, yeah, there, is, uh, there is work on that. But it seems that the circuitry community is proceeding faster than the, uh, than the exiton, uh, polariton community. But they are basically moving in the same direction of, of, of making strongly interacting uh, exiton uh, polaritons. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. those first results indicate that it is possible. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple uh, uh, questions in the chat. So the first is from George uh, Journey, who is asking to explain a bit more about the uh, polariton. So maybe you can just tell what the polariton uh, is. Yeah, so that's actually the literature is very broad on what the polariton is. Some people say it's a dress state between a photon and an atom. So if you put an atom in the cavity by this definition and you get Rabi oscillation where the photon comes out, goes in the cavity, goes back in the atom and you get this coupling, that's a polariton. So that is, that is a very kind of loose definition in the sense that uh, it doesn't involve any emotional aspects. Yeah? So I would say a polariton is the composite object that's formed if a heavier particle uh, binds to a, to a lighter particle, which is a photon, <laughs> if it's a polariton, and therefore acquires a different dispersion relation. And so uh, for that, you don't need a lattice, actually. Yeah? So if you think, think about this uh, exciton, polaritons, these are excitons in a two-dimensional slab, a semiconductor, which are coupled to a micro-cavity, which, uh, which contains the photons, and they are allowed to, uh, can move freely. Yeah? And, mm -hmm. so, and so that, that, that is, I think, the, the most uh, general definition that one says, a, harder, a heavier particle is dynamically coupled to a lighter one, which is a photon, and thereby you get a hybridized uh, uh, particle, a quasi-particle, uh, and it can be in a lower branch or in the upper branch, depending on which uh, which of the ingredients you have more, and then that's that's a polariton. 
Okay, so then uh, the next question is uh, quite general. So this is from Abdullah Kazi. Does uh, Stony Brook has a dedicated lab for quantum hardware? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, but of course it depends on what you mean by quantum hardware. Yeah? So we have, we have I, would, I would claim that what we have is quantum hardware because we do quantum physics with this. With this oh, yes, yeah. But, it's probably not something that you would sort of buy and then uh, uh, sort of uh, get get for yourself, but it fills an entire room. Yeah. So we have we have a, a lab on uh, quantum uh, communication. So Aiden Figueroa's lab, they build basically hardware that allows to has again to do with polaritons to to have photons interact strongly with each other or be stored in an atomic vapor, and so. They built hardware, yes, and there's also a company that uh, is affiliated with the lab that 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 markets these. Okay, the next uh, question actually is also uh, very interesting to uh, me personally. Is by Jason uh, Bennett. There has been some work with optical lattices modeling wild uh, Dirac materials. Is this uh, still purely uh, light atomic interactions in the lab? Is there some expensive upgrade? that needs to be done to study these uh, systems? Yeah, so there has been work, uh, for example, at ETH Zurich with, uh, with hexagonal and, and triangular lattices where they created band structure that, that show, uh, show a Dirac cone, and then you can study uh, the, the, the physics of that. Mm -hmm. And now in terms of is this purely light atomic interactions, this is purely atomic interactions in there. So there was no there was no uh, uh, coupling to a light field involved. But honestly, I think this could be very interesting <laughs> to, to, to study what would happen to an already exotic band structure if one makes it even more exotic with these with this polaritonic uh, couplings. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a question, is this, is this uh, expensive to do? And the answer is maybe the most the, the biggest expense is time here, yeah, because your quantum uh, simulators they, they are always uh, pretty dense, yeah. So what we have in in the lab, uh, and if you want to make big changes, you have to tear down what you already have, yeah. And so and so, uh, it's not typically possible to make these changes very quickly. Many people take the approach of building a new apparatus if they want to switch directions completely, even though it's not impossible to do it on an existing one. Okay, so uh, so the next uh, question is uh, also uh, about uh, polariton, also from uh, George. So, is the uh, polariton like a particle riding on a wave, uh, a photon? Hmm. I'm not sure when I can understand the uh, writing on the wave, but um, okay, it's a little bit. It's a little bit something that kind of changes the propagation properties of the photon. So you could think of this as. Uh, I mean, maybe I have an example, even though it's it's not. It's probably not correct. But I was just thinking of this because I saw this the. Uh, the other day, if let's say you are a kid and you're walking down the street and there's a swing there, yeah. And and so what do you do as a kid? You 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 stop walking, you go on the swing, you swing back and forth a bit, and then you continue to move, yeah. And so this this swing takes the role of the of the exciton <laughs> and the coupling to it. So the photon comes along, sees this very tempting coupling, yeah, gets slower as a result of that. And and then uh, uh, leaves in the end again. I mean, basically, it never leaves if it's a, a really a, a polariton. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it, drag, it drags the swing along. Yeah, <laughs> but it's is 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 slow. It's a really nice uh, analogy. So uh, the next question is by uh, Akash Behera, and uh, uh, you mentioned uh, they observed non-Markovian uh, oscillation of information. Can this interesting phenomenon be used to uh, simulate things beyond atomic energy level transition? Well, if I if I interpret this, I mean, 
an energy transition, I guess, is something which can be dealt with with the rate equation. Yeah, so you go from here to here, and you're you're done. It's it's irreversible, and that that basically tells you that there is an error of time after all. Yeah, so I mean, in quantum mechanics, it's unitary. The evolution is unitary, but why are there such things as irreversible decay? So. It has to do with the notion of open quantum uh, systems and uh, bias correlation time and so on. So the irre irreversibility comes basically because the quantum system itself is coupled to a much bigger quantum system, which dumps basically the excitation and the excitation take infinitely long to come back. Mm -hmm. So what we do there with a the non-Markovian decay is that we say the coupling to the system between system and bus is so strong that the bars cannot rip the, the excitation out, but the excitation is being lured back into the system. Yeah. And so and so we are basically in this transition going from an, an exponential decay to a perfect Rabi oscillation in the case of the couple to the band. We, we are basically destroying this uh, arrow of time completely and makes things completely uh, uh, reversible or unitary again. And so that's uh, that's uh, what I would call an interesting phenomenon, certainly, and it's uh, it goes beyond the atomic energy transition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, okay. Next uh, question: What are the uh, implications of uh, imaginary momentum and uh, negative uh, energy? The question by uh, Ujval Pandey. Yeah. So if you have Let's say you have a massive particle. If it has positive energy, it has positive momentum, or it has real momentum. And so, if you if you think about the particle in the wave duality uh, context, you have a wave which has uh, a phase e to the i k x. Okay, and this k is just square root of uh, of e basically. So if e becomes negative then I, uh, K becomes, or momentum becomes imaginary. And all this means is that your wave, which is E to the I KX minus omega T, turns into E to the negative KX minus uh, I uh, omega T. So this is something which is not able to propagate anymore. Yeah? And so this is something which you are uh, probably familiar with when you take, a let's say, a prism surface and you shine in a laser beam and the laser beam is totally reflected, then on top of the prism surface, you have an evanescent wave. You could think of this as this tail, which cannot move away. If you put the second prism on top of that, the evanescent tail can leak back into the glass and then move. Yeah? And so, and so these, these uh, imaginary momenta are very, uh, very much uh, 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 a familiar thing. Yeah? And so for, for massive particles, they are linked to negative energy. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, okay, so please uh, don't be shy also to just raise your hand and uh, ask. Okay, uh, the next question is by uh, Alan uh, uh, Rachmanimov. Um, how close uh, do you see uh, the fields of uh, nanoscience and uh, quantum mechanics coming in terms of uh, you know something like novel computers. So this is a good uh, general question. Yeah, so nano science becomes more and more and more uh, quantum, and actually it's not even necessary to be nano anymore. Yeah? So if you, if you, I mean, if you think about nanophotonics. That's a classical. Uh, that that's an example where you have where you can use it, for example, for quantum simulation. Yeah, you take some some microfabricated photonic waveguides and you let them couple to so evanescent waves again. Yeah, and so this way you can sort of couple. Um, 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 this way you can you can uh, uh, mimic a lattice system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's in in in, in the nanosciences. But if you look at the circuit QED platforms, they are in a millimeter size. Yeah. So they are, they are not nano at all. So it's, it's the, the statement that, that the PC is a macroscopic object because it's 10 micrometer big. Yeah. That, that is 
if you look at at the socket qd platform it's not at all uh, kind of surprising <laughs> that you can have coherences over over long lengths so so i would say nano platforms become more quantum but they are not necessarily needed for quantumness mm -hmm. if you are cold enough you can be you can be large yeah Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, uh, next question is by uh, Sidhan Kukade. Uh, how can we build a quantum uh, chip? Um, uh, does uh, VLSI engineers uh, play any role in designing and manufacturing the quantum processor? Uh, chips you know this is a question which i think i'm not able to answer but uh, we will have a, a talk on circuit qed yes and yes so, so i think this if 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 you uh if if you ask this question in that session there will certainly be an answer yeah absolutely so you uh yeah you should uh ask uh, this question mark reiter uh, or steve Gervin, uh later in this call. Okay, so I uh, don't see any further questions. So if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand or type it in the chat. So I'll give you another 30 seconds to come up with uh, another good question if you have it. But uh, if uh, not, then uh, please uh, come back at uh, 1 uh, p.m. when we will have uh, a lecture by Professor Martin Savage on uh, digital uh, quantum uh, computing. And uh, now I propose we uh, thank uh, Dominic uh, for this uh, wonderful lecture and uh, very uh, nice and clear answers. So thank you so much, Dominic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so goodbye, everyone, and uh, see you at uh, one. Thank you.